Greetings. Uh, welcome to this session. This is a union session on the DC area as a collaborative center for geoscience research. Uh, this particular session is being live streamed so that people can actually watch the session from wherever they are, which means they don't have to be in the room. So take that, keep that in mind as you're giving your talk today. Um, if you look up at the screen there, you can see that for the people that are accessing this uh, through the internet, there's uh, two ways to submit their question at any time uh, during the session. If we get questions uh, from uh, the audience that's out in the virtual world, uh, we have a, a helper back there that's going to raise some of those questions. All of that is provided that we actually leave enough time uh, in talks for to, uh, questions from either the immediate audience or the virtual audience. So I'm going to start off with a few comments, uh, just as we can uh, allow people to sort of filter into the room. And I'm going to give the motivation for this particular session. So this past year, I was the uh, president of the Geological Society of Washington. It's a small society, um, but it was one of the first geological societies in the nation. So it, it celebrated its 125th anniversary this year almost coinciding with the 100th anniversary of AGU. And I've been an AGU member for over 40 years, which is shocking to me, but uh, it's true. And when I first went to AGU meetings as a graduate student at UC Berkeley, I take the BART over and I go to these wonderful meetings with all these people that did things similar to me as opposed to the in my department where maybe one or two people did. But I was always really inspired by the AGU motto, which is unselfish collaboration in research. And I thought, yes, this is the group of people I really want to belong to. Well, like all organizations, we probably have uh, the promise that we would like to live up to. And so the purpose of, of today is really to explore how collaboration happens how to foster collaboration across disciplines, across groups, to take people that have been used to doing individual work um, and then uh, compiling that work together by allowing people to share their individual studies or designing the collaboration from top down. So today you'll hear both of these types of talks, both of these types of ways of approaching collaboration. Uh, you'll hear from uh, Robert Hazen from the Carnegie Institute of Washington, who's going to be talking about um, the rise, really, of a collaborative structure and culture and sharing of data and how best to do that. We'll hear Elizabeth Cottrell from the Smithsonian talking about um, the role that collections play. And I think over the weekend I heard that she had a conversation with somebody about how they can plan for, let's say, collecting rocks from deep sea drilling projects, et cetera. And, uh, plan on having them in collections and access uh, to a lot of people. So planning that, that those uh, rocks are going to be accessible in the future is an important part of developing research programs. We'll be hearing from Craig Schiffries of the Carnegie talking about the Deep Carbon Observatory. We'll hear from Isabel Casarelli of the USGS. And she runs a big water quality lab and serves herself as a collaborative center that reaches out to uh, both USGS and uh, agency and academic uh, workers. We'll also be hearing from a couple people who run or work with organizations uh, that are designed up front to be collaborative centers. Robert Detrick from IRIS is here. IRIS is really planned uh, originally to share and have a place to go and get seismologic data, and then it became a sort of focus for going ahead and planning new seismological missions, and he'll be talking about what uh, they've done and what their future goals are. Alain, Lynette Boisvert Bo Bo of uh, NASA will be talking about the Ice Bridge program, and then we'll also be talking about uh, the unacknowledged collaborators that lie behind a lot of scientific investigation. This is something dear to my heart because I use USGS stream gauging data all the time. Uh, Sujay Kashal will be speaking, and he uses USGS sensor data uh, very frequently. This is the underpinning of a lot of the research that's been done in the hydrological, and now more recently, the biogeochemical sciences and water quality investigation of rivers. All of the thousands of people that have gauged streams um, to really underpin this program are people whose names never appear 
on uh, papers or abstracts for the most part, and yet they're essential for the running of these programs. Our last speaker today will be Alexandra Schultz, and she'll be talking about national science policy and the role that collaboration, and actually DC itself is a collaborative center where lots of these agencies, uh, lots of these universities, lots of these uh, non-governmental uh, uh, programs also are, exist. If you are a speaker, you have 14 minutes today. It's a little bit shorter than normal. Um, but think of it as giving a 12-minute talk, and things will start flashing at, at you after that uh, uh, 12 minutes for your last two minutes. Thank you. All right, our first speaker is Robert Hazen from the Carnegie Institute of Science in Washington, and he's going to be speaking about data-driven discovery and the rise of the collaboration culture, collaborative culture, and data sharing. Thank you, Robert. Thanks so much, and thanks for having the opportunity to talk about this important idea of collaboration. What I'm going to be talking about today is the idea of deep-time data-driven discovery, and this is an extremely collaborative type of, of endeavor. We have earth, space, life sciences. We work with data scientists. We use large analytical and visualization techniques to try to see patterns in data at higher than just the normal two or three dimensions that we can put in a printed page. Um, so what I want to do today is, is focus on three things. First, describe an existing collaborative program, the Deep Time Data Infrastructure. Talk about a new ambition that we have to form an international 4D initiative that expands on this idea. And finally, talk about this uh, need for fair data policies and an open access sharing of data resources. So let me first tell you about the Deep Time Data Infrastructure. This was an effort which uh, was really initiated through the Deep Carbon Observatory that Craig Schiffries will be telling you more about. That's a big international program. We have funding from the Sloan Foundation, also very important funding from the Keck Foundation, Templeton, NASA, the Carnegie Institution for Science, and let me tell you right off that collaborative projects need funding. Uh, that's one of the things that drives, that provides the glue, so we're very excited that we have some of those funding efforts. We're interested in doing um, some, some big questions. So the questions that drive us are, what are the distribution and diversity of minerals on Earth? Minerals are the best preservers of the past. So if we want to understand Earth history, we need to understand minerals through deep time. We also are trying to compare different planets and moons, an important part of our program, and very much so understanding the co-evolving geosphere and biosphere. So this involves various projects. One of them, mineral evolution, looks at the, the change, the diversification of minerals over deep time, and that turns out to be principally because of biological influences we need big data resources, and so we've been building with the University of Arizona and Bob Downs group, the rough.info uh, slash IMA. It lists all the known and approved mineral species. It has various filters like chemistry, but what we've been doing is building the mineral evolution database. This is about an eight-year effort so far. It's brute force, paper by paper, line by line, typing it in, and Josh Golden at University of Arizona has played a leading role in that. And by doing this, we can basically assemble data in new ways. This particular graph shows first row transition elements. There are nine elements in all. We see the diversity, the number of different mineral locality pairs through time. This goes back to four billion years. And the colors have to do with the oxidation state of those elements, so we can see various trends. We can see epididicity in those minerals and we can also see changes in the redox state of the minerals. So that's mineral evolution. Mineral ecology is another approach looking at the diversity and distribution of minerals across the planet. And here we use the principles of biological ecosystem studies where we can basically look at the distribution and diversity. We rely very heavily, again, on, on large data resources that are maintained by others. Uh, so the collaboration with Jolyon Ralph in this case, who's uh, the head of Mindat.org, partly a crowdsourced database. What we can do is then look at various minerals, how they're distributed across Earth, come up with frequency spectra, just like you would do if you were walking through the woods and cataloging new plants. 
And then we can do accumulation curves. We can predict what's missing and go out and actually look for those missing objects. And the Deep Carbon Observatory is, is sponsoring now the Carbon Mineral Challenge, where we go out and look for missing carbon minerals, discover and describe those about 20 in all so far in the last couple of years. And then we use network analysis. This is another very important way of visualizing complex systems, networks in which each node, the colored node, represents an individual object, in these cases minerals, and then the links show different minerals that exist together. And one can uh, see some very interesting patterns uh, in higher dimensional space than you would otherwise. Um, this is work by Dan Hummer on manganese minerals. And just to give you a sense of, of how dynamic this is, you can do this with virtual realities. I'll show you in a little bit. There's a cluster here that's related to igneous manganese minerals. There's a cluster here related to metamorphic. But this big hairball here, all these minerals, which are generally of the higher oxidation states, those are the critical zone manganese minerals. And they're really affected by biology. So you're seeing in a graphical representation the huge importance of biology in in mineralogy. OK. Um, we can also apply network analysis to paleobiology, to fossil systems. This is work by our Harvard uh, University colleagues, and, and Andy Knoll and company. Uh, each one of these dots represents a family of animals from the last 500 million years. And the, net, the links show which families coexisted at the same time. So even though there's no time information per se in this diagram, uh, there is a time axis built into it. There's also very clear indications, pinch points where there are mass extinctions. And we can use this kind of analysis then to look for mass extinctions that hadn't previously been recognized. One of the things we've worked on very hard, and this is uh, Drew Macenti's work with Mike Meyer uh, and uh, our data scientist, Anirudh Prabhu, I was looking at the Ediacaran, this enigmatic period before the Cambrian explosion where there's lots of weird sorts of organisms. Maybe they're sponges or jellyfish or something that we're not quite sure about. In any case, they did a global inventory. They added these to PaleoBioDB. And then they did a network. And now that you're an expert on networks, can you see the mass extinction? Um, there's the earliest pneuma fauna. Ediacaran is also divided into the white sea fauna in yellow, the, uh, um, this nama fauna in blue, and there's some organisms that overlap. But very distinct pinch point there, which uh, through further analysis, and there's much more advanced networks now, which I can share with you. Um, it's in a manuscript that's just being um, in its final stages of revision. But it turns out there probably are two mass extinctions during this Ediacaran period that we can distinguish. So this is pretty exciting work that stems out of collaborative research um, for the deep time uh, data infrastructure. Please visit dtdi.carnegiescience.edu to see what we've been doing. But we're looking ahead. And the next step is to try to build what we call an international 4D initiative. 4D stands for deep time data driven discovery. And this international program tries to link Earth, space, life, and data sciences in ways to advance discovery of planetary evolution. So we held a workshop here in Washington, D.C. with international partners, about a dozen different countries represented in the 100 uh, attendees. Um, this was back in June of 2018. There is a website that describes in much more detail what we did. We had guiding scientific questions, and I think this has to be the beginning of any collaborative effort in science. We want to know how planets work. How do they evolve through deep time? We under, want to understand physical and chemical factors that contribute to habitability. We want to know whether, whether life has arisen elsewhere in the cosmos and how, in fact, life did arise. And, and also for Earth, the co-evolving geosphere and biosphere remains a very central interest and concern. So we have a huge opportunity, an international opportunity, to create a collaborative network. Um, we got a, Organize. This is lessons learned from the Deep Carbon Observatory, as Craig Schiffries will tell you. Organize, integrate, nurture this international community. And that partly means that you have to have funding for it. We need to have open access data resources, analytical methods, visualization platforms. And this is a shared resource. It makes a really democratic kind of science, because all you need is a cell phone to do great science if you have the right data resources that are open access. And then we need to have fundamental questions. And one of our great ambitions is to uh, engage and train an army of early career scientists, scientists who know coding, who understand the analytical and visualization opportunities for higher dimensional thinking, and can apply those methods 
to their own disciplinary domain. So this is the idea for the 4D initiative. We've already had many meetings and workshops. We have over 220 scientists engaged, a large fraction of uh, women in pre-tenure. We really think of diversity as being a key part of what we're trying to do. Here's our senior advisory council, which is just awesome. And speaking of DC collaboration, we have the president of the National Academy, Marsha McNutt, Rita Caldwell, former uh, director of the National Science Foundation, as well as Jim Olds, who is the AD for Biosciences. Uh, you'll see a couple of key people from the USGS, Linda Gunderson and Murray Hitzman, uh, Mary Wojtek from NASA, and of course, uh, Christine McEntee of AGU. So we, we certainly have a tremendous leadership team that's helping us and guiding us and moving this forward. Uh, we do a variety of things. Last Sunday, we had a workshop, a 4D workshop that was sponsored by the Deep Carbon Observatory to look at virtual reality. Um, here's Shauna Morrison, who has been a pioneer in using network analysis, uh, looking at a 3D virtual reality uh, image. This is carbon minerals. In red are carbon localities. In blue are the carbon minerals. And the thing that's amazing is we actually see topology here that's never been seen before. This was an extremely revealing kind of thing. Um, we also reach out to a community, and I am so proud of Cadence Boucher, who gave one of the AGU Bright Star posters today. Cadence is 12 years old. She contacted us. They, I'm fascinated by minerals. I'd like to know more about it. She wanted to do a mineral network project. She learned coding on her own and designed these, these incredible networks. And Cadence is here, I believe. Can you, Cadence, can you say hi? Hi, Cadence. <laughs> 12, there she is over here, 12 years old. Um, and just so inspiring to all of us, that, and this is part of an international collaboration all to really bring in everyone. Finally, I just want to emphasize the importance of fair data practices, the idea of making data accessible, interoperable, the idea of having quality controls of, of basically as a community, developing a culture in which we value data and that we use it in new ways. So we just need to really think about the culture of all our fields and how we can share data and then make those data interoperable so that we can compare data from different fields. And so as the very final part of my talk, I just want to give a shout out to the people who are doing the great heavy lifting of database development. Kirsten Leonard for EarthChem and IEDA. Just an amazing effort. She's been doing this for decades now. Um, Shannon Peters and MacroStrat, um, and Shannon also has played a key role in PaleoBioDB. We also use the Protein Data Bank because it turns out you can compare protein structures through time and, and see timelines in that, and that's part of Earth's evolution as well. So with that, I want to once again encourage you to go to our website, dtdi.carnegiescience.edu, to see our collaborative work. I want to thank the funding agencies and thank you all for your attention. So we have some time for some questions. Liz? At the beginning. Oh, actually, can you use the mic since we have a virtual audience? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and actually, if others have questions, you might as well get in the queue. You said at the beginning, so I'm going to go. At the beginning, um, you showed these different minerals through uh, time. I did. And it looked like most minerals are, were, isn't that like a really long time ago on the right side and the timeline goes to the left? So this is four billion years up to the modern time. Oh, so what okay. you see is the, the majority of minerals are from the last 500 million years and that's a preservational bias as well as there are more ephemeral minerals that appear in the record. Um, and that's another kind of preservational bias. So yeah, it's certainly absolutely very important that most of the minerals that are preserved are from the last uh, half billion years. Well, how did they just form? They form in a whole variety of ways, but many of them through biological processes. In fact, there's a huge amount of mineralization that occurred through the terrestrial biosphere, which only got established about 450 million years ago. So, so we see, that once again, the impact of life is just astonishingly important for the diversification and distribution of minerals. Thank you. Next question, please. Yeah. We'll move on to the next uh, question. Hi, Liz Cottrell, Smithsonian. Uh, in the spirit of this being a, a car and uh, having a DC-centric session, I wonder if there's anything planned uh, for the deep, your Deep Time initiative with the opening of the new Deep Time Hall at the National Museum of Natural History, which is going to be uh, probably the largest hall opening we've had, at least in the time I've lived in DC. 
Why, Liz, we should talk about that. That's a wonderful idea. And, and no, we haven't uh, initiated that conversation, but we certainly should because we're in DC and it's a great town for collaboration. Thank you. We're going to move on now to Elizabeth uh, Cottrell of the Smithsonian Institution. This one. And as we uh, pull her talk up here, um, I want to introduce my uh, co-convener, Eric Hankin from AGU, and I'm Karen Prestigard of the University of Maryland. Uh, Elizabeth. Uh, We'll be talking about the National Rock and Ore Collections at the Smithsonian. Thank you. Thank you, Karin, and thanks for putting together this session. Um, I figure it's Thursday afternoon of AGU, and we're all a little burnt out, uh, so I'm going to keep this fairly light. Um, but my talk theme follows really nicely on, on Bob's talk, and I, I think you'll see many of the same themes in what I have to say here. Uh, I'll start by talking about collections uh, broadly. Let's see, it's not advancing. There we go. Collections broadly, not just the national collection here in Washington, D.C., um, but why do we have research-based collections? Um, and there are many reasons, but I'll just bring up three. Uh, one uh, is things are difficult to collect again. Taxpayers put a lot of money into our science uh, to go and collect things. And here's an example here of a specimen uh, we can see that's from Kamchatka, a volcano in Kamchatka. We have a hand sample, we have a thin section, and this is by no means the most difficult place uh, to resample, but it's not the place you drive on the weekend either. Uh, so maintaining collections that prevent us from having to go out and recollect specimens is a major reason to have uh, a collaborative shared resource in museum collections and other repositories. Another reason is to have global coverage. Um, in the upper right is a, just a drawer, one drawer, uh, from the Seafloor Rock Collection uh, at the Smithsonian, where we have 18,000 dredge locations. Um, if you want to do science that is global in scope, we need shared um, collections. Uh, where you can not have to go to sea for three months, you, you just have to uh, put a request in through email and have the rocks sent to you. The gray locations in the ocean are all the known dredge locations of mid-ocean ridge basalts. The yellow dots superimposed now are the ones represented in the national collection. Uh, so you can do projects that uh, are truly sample the entire planet uh, with one-stop shopping with centralized shared facilities. And finally, I'm showing here uh, a banded iron formation from Western Australia. This is a, a core that um, is frequently sampled in our collection, and that is the power of shared uh, in, in this case, not data resources, but shared physical resources, uh, you can layer new analyses on top of old analyses. So once the major element chemistry is done, you can go through and layer the trace element chemistry, then the isotopes. Uh, and as we build, uh, we can accelerate our science much faster by going back to the same samples again and again. So now, uh, that, that's very general to collections. This is the... Uh, National, National Rock Collection, uh, 325,000 specimens uh, digital, in our digital database. They are available for loan uh, internationally, anyone uh, with an affiliation, for free. Uh, this is a, a service of uh, the U.S. government. And I have in the picture here Leslie Hale. Uh, I'm often the face of the collection at meetings like this, uh, but Leslie's the one who actually knows how to get the rocks out and to you. So for this talk, I thought to myself, you know, the main question I get is how, you know, what do you guys have? What do you have in the National Collection? What might you have that I need? And uh, so I asked uh, our informatics um, officer, Adam Manser, to run a query on the database and show me the keywords in um, this, this format where the size of the word represents the 
uh, number of specimens. I, I actually found this quite unsatisfying. You can see here, we have a lot of basalt, and we make a distinction. We also have a lot of glassy basalt. We have um, lots of pertitites and lurzolites and xenolith type words. We also have the word mineralized rock and unidentified. Uh, the collection at the Smithsonian is over 100 years old, and so there's a lot of legacy information there that's not necessarily in our database. And so I thought to myself, well, it's not really clear what we have in a figure like this. And so I said to Adam, can you make me um, a word chart where the word is sized for the number of specimens that a person has donated to the Smithsonian, because I think we know uh, really well what our colleagues might have worked on previously. And this is what came out. And I just heard Bob say, wow. And I barely got my talk together, because when I got this figure, I spent like three hours just staring at it, mesmerized. You can see in the upper right, we have Buddington. We have Bowen. We have titans of DC earth science. Uh, we see Boyd's name. Uh, we see, uh, well, there's uh, USGS, a uh, former director of the USGS, Dallas Peck, uh, Wilshire. We see Melson's name representing the seafloor glass collection, but also the individual donors like uh, Schilling and Henry Dick. Um, and as you as you look at this, um, I would say to our audience here and our remote audience and everyone in, in, this, in the spirit of Washington, D.C., ask not what your collection can do for you, but what you can do for your collection. What will your legacy be? Will your name as a geologist be among these giants of earth science in contributing 100 years from now to our collective knowledge um, and the advancement of science? Another thing uh, that might tell you something about our collection, and um, part of my charge today was to share recent um, exciting scientific results gleaned through the use of collections. And so I got a word chart of borrowers from the last decade <laughs> from the collection. And I was shocked when I got this to see my name so prominent. And at first I said, is this an error? Because um, it's not just because I'm the curator, it's like default big name. Um, no, it's not at all um, that. And um, uh, just try to avoid getting uh, a little choked up here. Um, the reason I'm such a big donor, a uh, borrower, is that uh, this represents 753 um, mid-ocean ridge basalts that were checked out by me for the postdoctoral project of Marion Levoyer, who was a postdoc working uh, jointly appointed between Carnegie and Smithsonian, a long-running DC collaboration. And the major elements were there. The trace elements were there. She layered on that um, volatile elements collected by Sims um, with Eric Howery, who uh, passed away in August and was definitely uh, the spirit of DC science. Um, and it was his vision and his leadership that allowed a massive project like this to go forward. So this is definitely a tribute to him uh, that my name is up there so prominently as a large borrower in the last decade. Something that we did with this relates to the Deep Carbon Observatory, which you just saw, which is a data product like this. This is one of the DCO's legacy data um, products. You're now looking not at magmatic carbon uh, measured by SIMS and not just those 753 samples. You're seeing that extrapolated to 711 segments with uh, total global coverage for mantle carbon, uh, the carbon concentration in the um, unmelted mantle. Uh, and again, this project was uh, led by Eric Howery, uh, who truly was a, a visionary titan of earth science in Washington, D.C. 
Also prominent on this word cloud is Hells, Roz Hells, who's a USGS uh, here in town. And she has um, analyzed 50 years worth of eruptions at Kilauea, massive data set. You're looking here at eruptions from 1983 to 2011. Uh, as, as a colleague of mine said, that's pretty much my entire lifetime. And you can see uh, the lava cooling, uh, the lava lake cooling at Kilauea. And uh, another project in the lower left, looking at samples in the collection from the Kilauea Iki Fire Fountaining event in 1959. Smithsonian has a collection of the tephra as it fell minute by minute with a description of the eruption um, and samples that were timed by the minute. And therefore, uh, she was able to do new microanalytical work um, on these samples to understand the coupled history of this magma uh, as it degassed and the geochemistry. Looking further, uh, I just wanted to get an international example. We see uh, Whitney Bear's name up there. This was a, a study about uh, the Mojave Lower Crust, and in fact, uh, the lead author of this study, Rachel Bernard, presented this work uh, in, a, in a session I was just in this morning. Um, these are xenoliths from the Wilshire Collection, and um, one of the discoveries they made is that even uh, when you have um, the lower crust and uh, upper mantle connected kinematically, you can see uh, anisotropy at the base of the crust across the moho due to different fabrics. Uh, and she learned that uh, without having to go in the field uh, by borrowing samples from the national collection. Also on here is another great example of uh, exactly what uh, Bob was talking about when he f referred to fair uh, data practices. This is a fantastic example of the power of collections to accelerate research. Uh, Jessica Warren was a prominent name. These are uh, xenoliths from the collection that have been checked out. These are uh, clinopyroxene. Uh, I think, or it might be orthopyroxene, I can't read the name at the top there, I think it's clinopyroxene, water contents um, from materials in the National Collection and from other places that they use to create a new uh, standard block for secondary ion mass spectrometry uh, for labs around the world. And I loved this uh, part of their paper where they say that of their 34 samples um, that they looked at, uh, 23 came from the Smithsonian, and of those, um, something like nine had already been characterized for water and major elements. So all they had to do was layer on the SIMS work. And in, in a beautiful cyclicity, they then did picked the grain separates from these xenoliths, donated them back to the Smithsonian so that we could loan them out to labs around the world so that Sims labs around the world now have a common standard set for measuring water in nominally anhydrous minerals. To finish up, I wanted to look towards the future. Uh, this is uh, pulled from uh, the consensus a report of the National Academy of Science, the ERUPT report, where they laid out three grand challenges in volcano science. And the third grand challenge, um, can you turn the, can't quite see the slide, um, is to develop a coordinated volcano science community to maximize scientific returns from any volcanic event. And uh, I, I strongly feel that the centralized collections have a big role to play. Um, when an event happens, if materials can come to a centralized facility, you, anyone in the world can work on them, and you're free of political constraints. You don't have to collaborate with someone. We can just advance the science. It takes um, the, something like the seafloor rock collection takes specimens um, out of uh, the tight grip of a PI's hands and makes it um, a democratic resource. So in closing, I'll just say that I asked for two additional word clouds. And so if you're out there, this is the word cloud of overdue loans. <laughs> and yeah. even more shameful, your name sized for the amount of time it's been overdue. <laughs> Some offenders have had samples since 1990. Okay, that's it, I'll take questions.
we have time for one question. So is that Bruce Marsh that's way overdue? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Craig Schiffries from Carnegie. So carbon is the element of life. Carbon-based fuels to this day supply most of our energy. The carbon cycle plays a fundamental role in controlling Earth's climate and planetary habitability. Yet the vast majority of research on the global carbon cycle focuses on a tiny fraction of carbon that's at or near the planet's surface. In contrast, the Deep Carbon Observatory focuses on the vast majority of Earth's carbon that resides in the planet's deep interior. So the DCO is a 10-year research program to discover the quantities, movements, forms, and origins of Earth's deep carbon. We don't know within a factor of 20 the concentration of carbon in certain parts of the mantle. We don't know within a factor of two the fluxes of CO2 from some volcanoes. And in fact, we have an expedition to Papua New Guinea making the first measurements of CO2 emissions from some very large volcanoes. So DCO, in order to address these very broad global questions, is fostering international collaboration. We're engaging almost 1,200 researchers from nearly 50 countries, and approximately half of those people are early career scientists. Our work is fundamentally interdisciplinary, and it bridges physics, chemistry, biology, as well as many different fields of geology. We do an extensive amount of field work, 80 sites, 30 countries, more than 250 people, in the Oman drilling project alone, there's more than 100 people involved. And just to give you a sense of scale, the Sloan Foundation pledged $50 million over 10 years to help support the Deep Carbon Observatory, and that's been leveraged by well over $400 million of support from other sources. So today I'm not going to talk about our scientific accomplishments, but I just want to point you to the bibliography. So DCO has published more than 1,300 peer-reviewed publications, including over 100 in Nature Science and PNAS alone. And I think that it's a tribute to the interest of this work beyond the narrow disciplinary bounds of most scientific papers. The paper on the right is a paper by Liz Cottrell, the previous speaker, and her colleague, Kitty Kelly. And I just can't go on without discussing at least one scientific paper. So in heading, what have you done for me lately? Last week's issue of Nature, I realize this is dated November 2018, but in the hard copy edition of Nature, this major article came out by Benedict Menez at IPGP and some of her colleagues on abiotic synthesis of amino acids in the oceanic lithosphere. This is essentially the Miller experiment done in nature. If this is replicated in other places, this could be one of the most important advances in our understanding of the origins of life. But my goal today is really to talk about collaboration. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the structure of the Deep Carbon Observatory. There's an executive committee. There's a secretariat or headquarters, which is based here in Washington, DC, which is why I'm giving this talk. So DCO is fundamentally a global endeavor. We're not a Carnegie uh, endeavor. We're not a US endeavor. We're a global endeavor. And we have a small headquarters in Washington, DC. It's a highly distributed program. There are four different science communities with each has its own steering committee. And then we realized that almost everything crosses boundaries up between these communities and we have a series of cross community teams. So again, most people are members of a science community or more than one science community. And almost everybody's involved in one or more cross cutting activities. So let me just focus for one second on the four science communities. Each one of the science communities has a very clearly stated set of guiding questions. They're on our website. Each science community has a very clearly stated set of scientific goals, decadal goals, again, on our website. And we have hundreds of members of each one of these science communities. Each community has produced hundreds of peer-reviewed papers. We also have these cross-cutting activities in areas like field studies instrumentation, we've been able to take very large risks over protracted periods of time by front-loading our decadal program with investments in instrumentation development. And some of these instruments were almost, you know, beyond bold endeavors to try to increase mass resolution by a factor of a thousand 
while simultaneously increasing abundance sensitivity by a factor of 1,000. This particular measurement of methane was so important to us that we simultaneously pursued two radically different approaches to making the same measurement, and they were both successful. Now there's a global user community of these instruments. In addition to the activities I've described before, as we come to the end of our decadal program, we want to synthesize what we've learned so that the whole is bigger than the sum of the parts. And our synthesis activities are brilliantly led by um, Marie Edmonds at the University of Cambridge. But I now want to focus on community building as a very explicit goal of the Deep Carbon Observatory. We do this in a lot of different ways, but our fundamental goal here is to produce collaborative international interdisciplinary research. So I just want to focus for a little bit on our early career scientists first. They're almost, they're more than half of our, our, our participating scientists. We invest heavily in the scientific and professional development of our early career scientists. We've held summer schools where we have people from around the world and all different disciplines coming together and learning from each other as well as the official instructors. Early career scientists were funded to develop to lead and, and uh, uh, early career scientist workshops. These are events by and for early career, career scientists. They've actually started new collaborations, new research projects that have been externally funded based upon their experience at these workshops. This last one was at Aetna. There was, the first one was in Costa Rica. So I just want to run through some of our major projects now that are being led or in some cases conducted entirely by early career scientists. So Biology Meets Subduction is a team of early career scientists from all four science communities. They conducted some very bold field work and tested some hypotheses about the connectedness between biology and subduction zones. And they, uh, I don't want to jinx them now, but I'm told their first paper is provisionally accepted in Nature. Um, another early career scientist, Sabin Zavarich, um, was helping us out in one of the areas where we were behind the curve, I think, in, in, in using plate tectonic models through deep time to visualize and solve scientific problems. And so he's now received a second DCO grant to extend this research even further. And we just have a brand new team led by um, Emma Liu on the left there and Karen Wood. So Emma's at Cambridge, Karen's at Bristol, and they just took us drones to make measurements of volcanic gases over some of the most important volcanoes in the world that have not yet been measured directly for CO2. They're going back twice more in the next several months. So the DCO was actually formed in Washington, D.C. Bob Hazen, the previous speaker, is the uh, executive director, the founder, the principal investigator. There was a workshop at Carnegie in 2008 that led to a major pledge from the Sloan Foundation in 2009. We held our first DCO international meeting in Washington, D.C. at the U.S. National Academy of Sciences in 2013. And to bookend the decadal program, next year we'll hold our final international science meeting at the National Academies. But we're, as I said, we're very much an international endeavor. So we recently met in China in March to build our community in China. Just last month, well, actually in October, uh, a university in Shanghai has announced the formation of a new international deep life research center that benefited from and builds upon the DCO deep life community at our meeting in March. We tried to expand our community in India last year and the year before that we held a symposium in Japan to get a larger number of collaborators in Japan. On the right you see the Japanese drilling vessel Chikyu and there have been two different DCO expeditions using this drill ship which the capital costs which were borne by the Japanese were a half a billion dollars and each of our expeditions cost them around 30 million dollars. These are very large investments and the Japanese uh, government has been one of the strongest supporters of the Deep Carbon Observatory science. The um, Italian community has always been very active. They're the third largest group within the DCO right now. But we wanted to work with them even further to study diffuse fluxes and tectonic fluxes of carbon dioxide in addition to volcanic fluxes. We're working with Peter Kellerman at Lamont and a very large international team on the Oman drilling program. Peter usually proudly states that the Deep Carbon Observatory put in the very first dollar. At this meeting, they have 51 abstracts from that drilling program. Uh, Claude Jopar of IPGP is leading a Task Force 2020 on what we're going to do after the end of the Sloan-funded decadal program. But now I want to go through a series of workshops here in Washington, D.C. You'll see at the center of that group is Liz Cottrell. And she shared a workshop and organized a workshop that has led to the DCO Modeling and Visualization Forum. She held that workshop at the Smithsonian in 2015. And we held another workshop on Modeling and Visualization at Carnegie yesterday, a much smaller workshop. 
Um, Russ Hemley and some biologists got together the extreme physics and chemistry and our deep life groups to start an initiative on extreme biophysics. And they jump-started that on our Broad Branch Road campus. Um, Jackie Lee of Michigan and Simon Redfern of Cambridge held a workshop at the Carnegie headquarters in P Street on earth and five reactions. And we had a, a tutorial presentation about that at this meeting here at AGU. Uh, a bunch of volcanologists came to synthesize their work on our campus. And I think Liz is in that picture in the front row near the left as well. And this is getting to, uh, uh, as we get towards the end of the decade, we want to um, get some, you know, better estimates of the global CO2 fluxes from volcanic systems. And Bob has already mentioned this 4D workshop on deep time data-driven discovery. So a lot of the new initiatives and a lot of the synthesis is taking place here in Washington. To make sure that we can continue beyond the end of the decadal program, uh, DCO worked with the Gordon conferences to launch last year, a, or this year rather, the first hopefully in an ongoing series of uh, conferences on deep carbon science. The second one's scheduled for 2020, and along with that, our early career scientists are organizing a Gordon Research Seminar by and for early career scientists. So in conclusion, the Carnegie Institution has a long tradition of flexibility and independence in pursuing science and an entrepreneurial and risk-taking spirit. And that entrepreneurial spirit is really important for us because we're trying to leverage $50 million with $500 million of other people's funding. And we need to take very large risks over protracted periods of time. So these characteristics are essential to DCO's success. Carnegie has unique expertise in earth, life, and space sciences and a proven track record in leading large international scientific programs. So this is an ideal place to serve as a global center for DCO's collaborative and interdisciplinary research. And then the clustering of scientific institutions in this area has been very important to the success of the DCO. And then finally, no less important than its scientific advances, DCO has built this enduring legacy in its diverse, dynamic, and interactive community of more than 1,100 scientists in 50 countries. And I believe that the community building and management innovations are keys to the scientific success, and in many cases rival the difficulty of the scientific challenges. But based on the scientific success, perhaps DCO might serve as a model for tackling other large-scale international and interdisciplinary science questions. Thank you. We have time for questions. I'll ask one. Uh, do you also uh, collaborate with people looking at the uh, shallow carbon? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question, because our ultimate grand goal is to have a planetary scale carbon, understanding the carbon cycle. And you can't use the phrase global because that phrase is misused for global coverage of the surface. So yes, we are very much focused on the deep carbon cycle, but the grand goal is to integrate that with the entire planetary carbon cycle. I think that was the name of Liz's workshop uh, to, to get exactly to that point. So there's plans to kind of get these two groups together in the future? Uh, we hope we're making some progress now and it's a long road. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah, go to, please go to the uh, microphone. Sorry. My name is Martha Maiden. I'm retired from NASA headquarters where I worked in the earth science. I just wanted to say that there is a global carbon cycle for the shallow, and, and it does include the oceans for, um, there's a group that it works on the, the the shallow global carbon cycle, and that would be probably a, a good collaborator. Right, now I've talked to the people at OSTP that run that and other global carbon cycle projects that largely to this day ignore the deep carbon cycle, which has far more than 90% of Earth's carbon. They might argue that it won't affect society on human time scales, but I would say, well, that's a hypothesis we might want to test a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Isabel Cazarelli. Um, she's limping her way on stage here, apparently, with uh, one injured foot. Uh, she's at the US Geological Survey, and she's talking about the analytical rat labs, one of which she runs, and the opportunities that they provide for advancing an understanding of natural resource challenges. Isabel.
Oh, thank you very much, everybody, for attending, and thank you for the invitation, Karin. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, USGS Analytical Research Labs. I am in the USGS Water Mission area right here in the D.C. area in Reston, Virginia, and I have a geochemistry research lab, um, which is part of Water Mission Area Headquarters. And so I'll tell you a little bit about how we've had success um, using and uh, our research lab as kind of a center of collaboration in order to get our projects accomplished. So I don't know how many of you attended um, our new director Riley's talk earlier today, but uh, USGS you know, has several different mission areas with um, our ultimate mission being to provide the nation with reliable scientific information. So we're an unbiased uh, scientific information agency um, charged with understanding the earth to minimize the loss of life and property from natural disasters, manage water, biological energy, and mineral resources, and enhance and protect our quality of life. So our um, analytical research labs are part of addressing this mission. Um, so we reach across geographical boundaries, both within the nation and internationally, to do this mission critical science. Uh, we can be hubs for interdisciplinary and responsive science, responding to new needs that come up within the nation. Um, we develop uh, critical new tools and concepts uh, to protect the protect the nation's resources. In addition, we can be a training ground for the next generation of natural resource scientists, and we have strong connections to the external scientific community. And I'll touch on aspects of each of these points in my presentation. So I mentioned I'm in the water mission area, and I'm, I don't know if you can see that little star near Washington, DC, but that's our headquarters. That's where I'm located. But the water mission area has a large geographic footprint all across the nation. And this really allows us to do, um, those of us that are in the laboratories, um, to reach out and do collaborative projects that engage both local and regional stakeholders by connecting with our counterparts within USGS that are located in states and regions across the country. In addition uh, to water's footprint, we also have programs that fund interdisciplinary science that cross the different mission areas. This is just a map here that shows the locations within USGS that are funded by uh, the Toxic Substances Hydrology Program and Contaminant Biology Programs that um, really help motivate interdisciplinary science. Most of the funding that my projects uh, have most of the funding that's um, supported my projects has come from those programs. And so um, many of these centers actually contain advanced laboratory capabilities that are uh, engaged in this collaborative science at you know, the local, the regional, or the, or the national scale. Um, so uh, one of the things that we can focus on when we have an um, analytical research laboratory is some long-term interdisciplinary process-oriented research. And that's really hard to accomplish if you don't have uh, physical uh, analytical tools with which you can apply, that you can apply to new problems. Um, an example here is we do um, field observations and field and laboratory experiments that we use to determine how transformation of organic contaminants uh, impact water and sediment chemistry over the long term. One of the projects I've been involved in for my entire career now at USGS, which is 32 years, has been studying the natural attenuation of contaminants from the Pemidji, Minnesota crude oil spill site. And so we're, we're focused on targeting transformations that have uh, potential health impacts, and developing new tools to trace contaminants. Uh, if you were here Monday, uh, you might have heard of a couple of the tools that um, members of USGS's uh, research group are involved in, and that includes uh, Carl Hasse presented on 
um, looking at uh, trace hydrocarbons and at very low levels. And then Barbara Beacons talked about um, metabolites, um, so as using those to trace contaminants. And these results we share, um, open, they're open to everybody, but specifically used by industry, consultants, regulatory, educational, and uh, research institutions. So um, we're also in a position in our analytical research labs to be able to be responsive to when there are risks or hazards to natural resources. I just have two examples here. One was um, the uh, 2014 MCHM spill that occurred in the Elk River in West Virginia. Uh, this was big news. 300,000 people lost access to their drinking water supply. And here you can see Denise Acob, who runs the Reston Microbiology Analytical Lab here, and her staff collecting samples in the Elk River. Here the goal was to understand the persistence of the mixture of contaminants in the river system. Also, we're looking at uh, unconventional oil and gas wastewaters. This was the result of a, a pipeline that broke in Blacktail Creek in North Dakota, releasing 11 million gallons of wastewater into the creek. And you can see there Adam Mumford, who is our, uh, was our Mendenhall postdoc, who's now uh, recently hired as one of our laboratory managers, collecting samples through the ice of Blacktail Creek. Again, the goal there was to identify useful tracers of the source material and look at the potential long-term impacts to water quality, ecosystem, and human health. Our analytical research labs are also great opportunities for students to be involved, and they serve as places where we can do teaching and mentoring. Uh, we have an extensive internship opportunities in the DC area in our labs. Uh, we have uh, the NSF graduate student internships, NAGT undergraduate um, internship opportunities, and also we can do some direct hires to hire field, summer field assistants. And here you can see some pictures of some of our students. Um, on the lower left, we have uh, three of our undergraduate students that we've worked with collecting samples at sites impacted by uh, oil and gas wastes in West Virginia, Montana, and North Dakota. And they contributed to our understanding the effects of the wastewater releases on water quality as well as aquatic and human health. Uh, to the right, this was a collaboration that I have with Virginia Tech uh, professor Maddie Schreiber. And this is our, uh, her student, uh, Brady Ziegler, who I co-advised. Um, and here he is uh, with an exceptional example of a core collected at the Bemidji Research Site. Uh, Brady has gone on now to get an assistant professor position at Trinity College. And then to the right is a Virginia Tech uh, undergraduate working in our lab, Cala Flager, processing the core samples. Uh, their work contributed to our understanding of the issue of arsenic mobilization and transport in groundwater affected by anthropogenic carbon inputs. And there you can see uh, a 2D diagram of the development of an arsenic plume due to hydrocarbon degradation under iron reducing conditions. We also have a lot of connections through uh, academic and industry collaborations. This is just one example from Michelle Laura's lab. She's in the USGS Maryland, Delaware, DC Water Science Center. And she has a collaboration with uh, Johns Hopkins University and Geosyntec to develop a reactive barrier to remediate chlorinated solvents through combined anaerobic and aerobic biodegradation. And you can see some pictures of uh, Michelle's laboratory and the field where she's developing these cultures in the lab and then applying them to the field to test the effectiveness. So um, we, the keys to our successes in these um, analytical research labs have been achieved by increasing the number of internal and external collaborators over time and leveraging funds across projects, programs, and mission areas. Uh, our current connections to science and policy institutions in the area uh, we have, but we realize that we can further expand those to improve our scientific contributions, enhance the communication of our results, and leverage uh, what we all realize are very limited resources. Uh, opportunities 
include those expanded connections with professional societies in the area, such as AAAS, AGU, ASM, uh, other federal agencies that we're already collaborating with, EPA, DOE, and NIH. We can expand those and look at relationships with other additional agencies, as well as uh, academic institutions. So uh, that's what I have for you, and if anybody has any questions that they can't get addressed here, please feel free to contact me. My email address is on the board, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you. So we have time for questions. Are there any? So I have one. So the Bemidji site in Minnesota, that was a, uh, a hydrocarbon spill and is, if I have it correctly, is that a site where they've been looking at the natural attenuation of the contamination? Yes, and it is. The, um, it's a crude oil spill. Yep. It was a pipeline break. And we've been looking at the natural um, attenuation of uh, hydrocarbons for decades now. And, you know, those things can be slow processes. So we're lucky that we're able to take a long-term view. And um, over time, we've discovered new things like the importance of the metabolites of the hydrocarbon mm -hmm. degradation, for example. So has it been fairly effective? Do you, does that inform us on, on whether we should do re, you know, pump and treat remediation, or has this been one of the major sites that really tells us we, we can take it a little differently in terms of how we manage these types of spills? We, we absolutely are learning things that can be applied then to how you clean up or don't have to clean up these spills. Um, they are, what we're finding is the source zones are persistent, mm -hmm. but the dissolved plumes down gradient, the things like the benzene plume seem to be fairly stable. But we're finding new things like this large plume of metabolites that there's not that much known about yet that maybe we should start shifting our attention to some of the other compounds that have received less attention in the regulatory community. Interesting. Thank you. And time to move on? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Time to move on. Oh, we have time. We have time. We have okay. Time. We have time. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, uh, I used to work with contaminant hydrogeologists. Um, 20 years ago, there's a more field site. So right now, in addition to the Bemidji site, uh, does USGS uh, funding other sites, you know, we used to have a boarding site, we have the med site, we have some USGS in northeast on uh, granite, something like uh, fracture rock. So we do have uh, many other sites where we're looking at um, biodegradation or natural attenuation processes in situ. Um, many of them are not as well instrumented or as well studied as the Bemidji site, but you probably are familiar with the sewage plume in Cape Cod, which is another USGS long-term research site, which is very highly instrumented. Um, but we're looking at other sites that are contaminated also uh, with hydrocarbons specifically, but that's a, a smaller scale and a shorter time frame. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Bob Dietrich from IRIS, and Bob is going to talk about the role of IRIS in collaborative research in the geosciences. Uh, thank you, and thanks for uh, the opportunity to uh, uh, contribute to this session. Um, so what is IRIS? IRIS stands for Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology, and IRIS is actually uh, several things. It's um, uh, first of all, it's a nonprofit 501 3C uh, corporation. We have about a $34 million a year uh, budget, about 60 uh, employees. Our headquarters are here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we actually are located in the AAAS building just a couple blocks from the, uh, from the convention center here. Um, we, uh, we also, though, are a university consortium. And uh, we have 127 uh, member colleges and universities across the, U the United States. Um, we also have uh, 128 foreign affiliates, as well as uh, nearly two dozen educational affiliates. And finally, we're a uh, facility operator. Uh, we operate facilities primarily for the National Science Foundation, 
that offer instrumentation services, um, data archiving and distribution, and education and public outreach. Uh, IRIS has been around for over three decades, 34 years, um, and um, we've, during that period of time, uh, uh, facilitated a number of, of major uh, seismic experiments and operated seismic networks around the world. And that inherently involves uh, a great deal of collaboration and partnerships, uh, partnerships at the state level, at the federal level, and uh, internationally. And so what I thought I'd do in this talk is to just give three illustrations of some of this um, uh, uh, collaborative science that IRIS has uh, uh, been instrumental in uh, pursuing and focusing particularly on, you know, this being Washington, D.C., focusing particularly on the federal partnerships that we've um, utilized in order to, uh, 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 you know, ch achieve these, uh, these different results. So the first thing I was going to mention was the Global Seismographic Network. Um, this is a 152-station um, network. It, it's been around for 30 years. Uh, it's one of our longest-running programs. And, uh, and it's widely viewed as the sort of gold standard of, of high-quality global seismic networks. When you hear or on the news or read in the paper about uh, an earthquake in the Himalayas or in Southeast Asia, the uh, location of that earthquake and the characterization of the magnitude and nature of that earthquake is based on data derived from, uh, from this network. Um, the network stations are indicated uh, by the red stars on this, uh, on this map. Um, the GSN is unusual in a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, you, the GSN is operated as a partnership between um, IRIS, funded by the National Science Foundation, and the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, and uh, we partner with the U.S. Geological Survey's Al Albuquerque Seismic Laboratory. And, uh, and, and although it's, it's funded by two different agencies, we have a single uh, community committee that oversees the operation of, of this network. But we also have partnerships with other federal agencies that have contributed to the infrastructure that comprises the GSN, including the Department of Energy, the U.S. Air Force, and the Department of State, over the years have all contributed to the GSN. The data from this network are freely and openly available to any interested investigator, and I'll talk a little bit about, the, about that later. The other thing that makes the, um, the GSN uh, a little unusual is that it's what we call a dual-use network. So um, it both supports basic research into earthquakes and earth structure, uh, which are primarily the interests of the NSF-funded investigators, but it also uh, is used for rapid earthquake characterization, tsunami warning, and nuclear test monitoring, uh, which is central to the missions of, for example, USGS, NOAA, and, uh, and, uh, and, and the Department of Defense. Uh, so it's this kind of very unique marriage between uh, a basic research and, uh, and um, I would say, mission-driven research, uh, but utilizing the same facility. So the next example, uh, and one that uh, I think uh, cuts close to home here, is uh, something that we call the Central and Eastern U.S. Seismic Network. So some of you that were around uh, here in Washington in 2011, Remember the Mineral Virginia earthquake? It was a magnitude 5.8 earthquake, um, which was widely felt in Washington, D.C., caused damage to buildings in Washington, including the National Cathedral and, and uh, Union Station. Um, this earthquake was kind of a wake-up call for, uh, for people, uh, both the general public, uh, scientists, uh, 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 emergency managers, and politicians that earthquakes don't just occur in California or Alaska or the Pacific Northwest, but they can occur in the eastern United States as well, and, uh, and damaging or and potentially damaging earthquakes. Um, and, and, and there was a realization that uh, there was a need uh, for improved seismic monitoring in the central and eastern U.S. It turned out that about this same time, um, IRIS was involved in a major project funded by the National Science Foundation 
to improve our understanding of the tectonics and structure of the North American continent. This project was called Earthscope. Um, and one major component of Earthscope was something called the transportable array. And this was an array uh, of about 400 broadband seismometers, uh, seismic stations, if you would, that were deployed on this regular grid that you see here on this map with stations located about 70 kilometers apart. And um, the way this uh, grid was developed was to take these 400 stations, we started on the west coast, and we gradually, over a 10-year period, moved the array from west to east um, uh, till we reached the east coast. And we completed this array, which is uh, about 1,700 stations uh, across the lower 48 states. And this, this happened between 2004 and 2015. And so with that in mind, um, IRIS worked with um, the Office of Management and Budget at the White House and with um, federal agencies, National Science Foundation, USGS, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the Department of Energy to leave behind um, almost 160 of these stations with the idea that these stations would then provide a long-term, higher quality seismic monitoring capability in the central and eastern U.S. Uh, so this required a lot of uh, interagency collaboration, a lot of kind of behind the scenes discussions, uh, uh, deciding where these stations should be located, where some of the critical infrastructure such as nuclear power plants that required uh, uh, a higher level of, of, of monitoring. And so that was all worked out and, um, and as of last September, uh, the operation of these stations was formally transferred from IRIS with, the, with its NSF support to the U.S. Geological Survey. And going forward, the USGS is going to maintain and operate this network. So we think this is a great example of good government because it's essentially taking the investment of one agency, uh, of the, uh, the National Science Foundation, and leveraging that to benefit um, other agencies uh, uh, other, with different missions than the National Science Foundation. So a great example of, of, um, of good government and I think one that was really uh, maybe not have happened if all of these, if all of the key players weren't here in Washington DC and could discuss this. Uh, another point that I might make, although that the motivation for that was originally um, uh, based on uh, improving our understanding of natural hazards, it turns out, of course, that the data from this network can be used for many other things. Uh, oil and gas development, uh, uh, monitoring wastewater injection, and of course the whole issue of induced seismicity, which in 2011 really wasn't an issue on anybody's plate, but uh, the recognition that uh, fracking uh, can lead to uh, induced seismicity, this network in, is been extremely valuable in the U, eastern U.S. in terms of setting baselines of what uh, natural hazards are prior to uh, uh, large-scale fracking and, uh, and, then, and then monitoring uh, the uh, levels of induced seismicity that might occur because of that in the central and eastern U.S. So the final example um, I'll give is, is um, data sharing and we heard a lot about that in some of the earlier talks. Uh, I think it's fair to say that um, uh, IRIS has been one of the pioneers of, of, um, of data sharing and data distribution, certainly in the geophysical sciences. And um, IRIS has a large uh, data management center in, the, uh, in Seattle. Uh, again, it's been uh, in existence for about um, 30 years. Uh, it's the world's largest facility for the archiving, curation, and distribution of waveform seismic data from both permanent networks, like the global seismic network that I mentioned earlier, but also from portable um, deployments of seismometers uh, throughout the world. As of today, um, the, uh, uh, our data management center in Seattle um, uh, archives data from uh, over 10,000 permanent stations around the world, in over 70,000 temporary stations around the world. About 
uh, over 3,500 of these stations provide data in real time um, to, the, um, uh, to the data center. And you can see uh, from the uh, uh, plot in the upper right-hand corner, the size of this uh, data repository has been growing exponentially uh, over the years and now totals uh, nearly half a petabyte of data. Uh, these data are very widely used. Um, uh, and uh, in last year, we distributed over a petabyte of data, um, a thousand terabytes of data, that is, to uh, users in over 150 countries around the world. So this data center is really the go-to place for uh, 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 people interested in earthquakes or earth structure from anywhere in the world. Um, this is the place where you'll find those data. But we've been trying to build up uh, international collaborations as well. Uh, there are many other data centers, not as large as the data center we operate in Seattle, but there are many um, data centers in um, Europe and uh, elsewhere around the world. And one of our more recent initiatives is to, is to set up a federation of seismic data centers. And currently we have 18 data centers in countries around the world that are partners in this federation of data centers. And the neat thing about this is that you as a user can make a single request to one of these data centers and have access to data from any one of the federated data centers with a single web services call. And finally, just as a final example of, um, of, uh, of, of sort of leveraging an investment made by one agency, federal agency to another, uh, this data center that we have at the, in Seattle is also going to be distributing through a partnership with NASA and JPL um, the data from the uh, Mars InSight mission, which as many of you know has a seismometer. And uh, so we'll be providing that data not just to researchers, but to uh, the general public. And, and in fact, we have a, a, of an effort to disseminate these data to schools and uh, we'll have a web app and a, a smartphone app to really disseminate these data quite widely. Uh, and we think there's gonna be tremendous, uh, tremendous interest in this data in the general public. So this is my last slide, just kind of a summary, you know, that we have been very successful at using seismology to advance scientific collaborations on a very broad scale through partnerships with many federal agencies. We have MOUs with over 100 organizations around the world. Um, and, and, and I think a key to this is, is the promotion of free and open exchange of data. Um, and this is quite beneficial. But I do say that, that the sustaining these partnerships isn't easy. And uh, it requires a lot of work and a lot, a lot of personal interactions in order to um, you know, sustain these collaborations when you have changing leadership in agencies, you have changing individuals in agencies, and of course looking at international collaborations, you have the challenges of, of maintaining these collaborations long term on an international scale. So thanks very much, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Um, we're out of time for questions. Our next speaker is Lynette Bover of NASA, and she'll be talking about the uh, NASA Operation Ice Bridge program, a collaborative effort to monitor the Earth's changing cryosphere. Okay, uh, hi everyone. Um, so I'm gonna talk about NASA's Operation Ice Bridge, which is one of the one of NASA's longest running airborne campaigns to date. And um, one of the main reasons why we've been so successful over the years is due to the hard work and collaborations of all involved in IceBridge, those on the science aspect, the engineering aspect, the pilots who fly the plane, and other agencies that we collaborate with. So um, why was Operation, why was IceBridge started? Um, so Basically, in 2003, NASA launched a, a laser altimeter satellite called ISAT, and this was um, meant to measure changing elevations of the ice sheets, glaciers, and sea ice um, throughout the year. And this, message, this mission ended in 2009, and the next um, follow-on satellite mission to ISAT, ISAT-2, um, wasn't supposed to launch till 2018, and it launched in September 2018, but 
in between these, um, this like almost 10 year gap, we, um, we Operation Ice Bridge was created to essentially bridge the gap and have continuing, continuing um, measurements of the ice and um, the sea ice and the land ice. So that's why Ice Bridge was created. And um, it's really important to monitor the cryosphere because melting land ice and glaciers causes sea level rise, which affects everyone on Earth. And the loss of sea ice, co sea ice cover will change um, ocean atmosphere interactions and change weather and climate patterns throughout the globe as well. So um, we know that the, the sea ice is decreasing in area, um, but we don't know if the thickness is changing or how it's changing or how the snow on top of the ice is changing. And um, the, for the ice sheets and glaciers, we know that you know, Antarctica and Greenland is losing ice, but which areas are losing more ice and why is this happening in some areas and not others? And so um, Operation Ice Bridge and the data we collect actually help us monitor these changes and learn and understand um, what's happening in the cryosphere. So our goals are, we have four main mission goals, um, to make airborne altimetry measurements over the ice sheets and sea ice that were started with ISAT, um, to also link and bridge the gap between ISAT and ISAT-2 with these measurements and also um, compare with another, uh, alt another altimeter called Cryosat to have a long-term um, altimeter, re altimeter record. We also wanted to, we also monitor key rapidly changing areas of the ice in the Antarctic and the Arctic to maintain this long-term record. And our last goal is to provide key observational data to improve our understanding of ice dynamics and better constrain predictive models of sea level rise and sea ice conditions. Um, so what is Operation Ice Bridge? So we're a multi-year dual pole airborne campaign and these two figures show um, all of our flight lines our science flights that we've flown sent from 2009 to this past November. Um, and we've flown over 795 science missions, which is a lot. And we tend to fly over the same um, repeat tracks from year to year to monitor the changes in the cryosphere. Um, and so to determine where we're gonna fly and what missions we fly, we work a lot with our Icebridge science team who are experts in the field. So where have we been on an ice bridge? So um, these are all the locations we've been stationed at to do our missions. Um, so we've been to Greenland, Alaska, Svalbard, and then um, in the Southern Hemisphere, we've been to Chile and Argentina and also on the Antarctic continent itself. And um, all these different locations, when we're there, we have to collaborate with local meteor meteorolo meteorologists to um, look at the <laughs> sorry to look at the um, at weather maps and forecasts so we can determine which flights we should fly because we don't want clouds. Um, we have to collaborate with local governments and militaries and local airport operations as well, and also um, collaborate with the pilots of the plane. So we've been on multiple platforms as well, depending on. Um, where we're located and what needs we need for our flights. And so this is another collaborative effort because these different planes are located at different NASA centers or we've also um, used a NOAA plane and uh, NCAR plane. So we have to work with these other agencies as well as all the different pilots and flight crew and flight mechanics for each plane as well. Um, we also, so we fly a whole suite of instruments. We're not just, a, we don't just fly a laser altimeters on board. We also fly um, multiple snow radars. Um, we do um, an air grab, which measures the bathymetry under the ice. Um, we also have temperature, um, measurements of the skin temperature on board and visual images on board as well. Um, the laser altimeters actually give us the surface features and the elevations of the ice, as you can see on the left from um, the airborne topo topo topographic mapper. And um, the snow radars actually give us the um, accumulation of snow from year to year on land ice. And um, also, the radars can give us the um, thickness of the ice and the bedrock underneath. 
So this is just uh, the project organization kind of tree. Um, so the Project Science Office, we're located in Goddard Space Flight Center, and we work closely with NASA headquarters in DC for, our, for all of our um, missions. And then we also work with the science team, which is um, people around at different universities who are experts in the field of land ice or sea ice. We also have to work closely with the aircraft offices um, for each different science platform we use. And then the, we also work with the instrument teams for installing the instruments on the plane and generating the data products, which are then sent to the National Snow and Ice Data Center. That, and, and they're available to the public. So we've collaborated with lots of different people over the years. Um, we've collaborated with the European Space Agency doing underflights of um, like four or three or four of their different satellites. And we've also overflew field, uh, field camps as well. Um, we have worked with the US Navy and the Department of Defense. We've worked with NOAA. We've worked with the USGS, the Office of Naval Research, um, and also with NASA and ISAT2 and ISAT. Um, we, even are, we even have to collaborate in flight on the fly. So this past year, this past um, October, we had a, our first coincident um, underflight of ISAT2, which was just launched in um, September of this year. And we did it overnight. And um, so this, this was also over sea ice and sea ice drifts. So in order to fly over the same ground, the same ice that ISAT2 flew over, we had to adjust for the, the drift of the sea ice. And so we would work with the pilots and tell them we want to go down to a lower altitude to take wind measurements. And we would determine where the ice had moved to. And we'd actually change our, our flight path throughout the flight. So that was like a really big collaborative effort with that. And then also working with the ISAT2 project office to determine where the satellite was actually going to be and when. Um, we also collaborate with various types of media. So um, we have worked with national media outlets, local media outlets, you know, telling, telling, the, telling our Icebridge story and what we're doing, you know, in the Arctic and Antarctic. Um, we've also worked with our NASA outreach it, itself, and we put out stories on Twitter and Snapchat and Facebook, and some of us even write blogs. We also have um, smaller um, documentary teams that have come on, photographers, artists that come on and take pictures and then make these beautiful paintings of the ice that they see outside the plane. We also have, um, we've also had the US ambassador to Chile this past, this past fall. And um, we also do a lot of education outreach, outreach, which is really awesome. So we have a way to chat with students in classrooms all over the world while we're flying on the plane. They ask us questions. We tell them what we see, how we got into science. And since we started doing this in 2012, we've reached over 10,000 students. And we also go to classrooms um, when we're at our, at our different bases, when we're in the field, and talk to the students to try to inspire the next generation of scientists. So um, Icebridge data has also helped other um, projects. This one is called OMG, or Oceans Melting Greenland, and it's another NASA product, what, I mean, project where they're looking at the bathymetry of the oceans around these outlet glaciers in Greenland to try to determine what makes, if, if the oceans are warming and melting the ice and what different of the bedrock below is causing this to happen. So some areas are more susceptible because the water is able to go up underneath the ice shelves and melt from below as well as above from the atmosphere. And so Icebridge actually helped them out with all of our, um, all of our measurements. And you can see the picture on the left is before the, the, the bed map of, of Greenland before. Um, Icebridge data was collected, and then after, it's a much higher resolution, and we actually learned a lot more. Um, our data actually also helps to um, be used with long-term records for, of in situ data in the Arctic. So this is just um, some results from a paper where um, they used 
in situ snow observations back from 1950 from, from Russia, and also um, our ice bridge snow depth on the sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. And from this long-term record, they found that the sea ice over, I mean, the, the snow on the Arctic sea ice was becoming thinner because the ice is freezing up later in the fall, and there's, this is when we get most of the snow accumulation. So that was another thing. Um, so what have we accomplished? So we have collaborated with multiple scientists, engineers, technicians, pilots, and crew to keep our um, campaign running, and it's so successful. And we've also collaborated with lots of other U.S. government agencies, especially in D.C., and also, and also international agencies, to underfly satellites and overfly field, campaign, uh, field camps to improve our scientific products and also theirs. Um, so since the start of IceBridge, our data has been used in over 560 publications. And we've found out that um, we've, we've actually learned a lot from our data. So we found, for, for example, a mega canyon beneath the Greenland ice sheet that is actually bigger than the Grand Canyon. Um, we found that this the snow on top of the Arctic sea ice is thinning, and that actually Alaskan glaciers are helping to cause sea level rise as well. Um, so if you want any more information about IceBridge, there's a website, and all of our data are freely available at nsi2c.org for the public to use. Okay. We have time for some questions. Hard to see up here. Yeah, I know. Um, I have one. Um, so, with all these different flights from all this uh, different equipment, you have uh, a whole army of people that is then reducing these data um, to put them in the sort of the same format as the previous satellite uh, products. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that sounds horrendous. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it takes a lot of work from a lot of people to get all the data products out, but. You know, they're out and publicly available, and being able to talk at conferences and at like AGU is one way where we can reach more scientists who can even propose flight plans for us to do if it fits in with our mission goals. Um, so, And you'll keep flying a, um, a little bit even after the satellite's been launched? Yeah, so we're set to fly all of next year to help with CalVal efforts with ISET2. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So our next talk is uh, by Sujay Koshal, and while he's coming up here and we're loading the uh, presentation, um, I'm going to say a, a few things. Um, this next talk is actually going to be a collaborative effort between uh, Sujay Koshal and myself. Uh, our co-author is Carolyn Plank, and we're all at the University of Maryland. We're actually in the same department but in different buildings, so Suji and I usually only see each other at places like this, so we thought we'd do some collaboration here. What we want to do in our talk today is to uh, really honor all the people that have gone into the collection of data um, from the USGS. So if you go to the USGS website, and download stream flow data because you want to use it to analyze for floods or you want to um, see what the current discharge is on the local river to see if you can go kayaking or something. Um, or if you want to use it to develop uh, data for your own research. Those data come from USGS employees, thousands of them probably over the years, that have gone out to the field to measure a stream discharge along uh, every river that appears on a USGS uh, website and its archives of uh, gauging station records. And the discharge data isn't provided by some magically uh, appearing data that's being measured directly from the river, but instead it comes from people wading across or putting uh, instrumentation down or working from boats to collect uh, area, velocity, and calculate discharge that they then uh, use to develop a rating curve. And a rating curve is the relationship between um, discharge 
and the gauge height. The gauge height can be um, monitored indirectly. It used to be done with something that looked like the same float that you had in a toilet bowl, and uh, now it's essentially the float, that, uh, now it's usually uh, pressure transducers or, or other ways of monitoring uh, stage height very accurately. So when you look at uh, USGS uh, discharge record, this is just a short-term record for Zakaya Swamp Run, and uh, you'll see that little red star there that says, hey, somebody went out and made that measurement on that day, and it's right in line with the actual uh, calculated discharge from the stage discharge relationship. This meant that, means that the stage discharge relationship is actually pretty good. And this is for Zakaya Swamp Run that has like 12 or 14 independent channels that together um, provide all of that discharge. And I happen to know that that particular river uh, went out of bank and formed three new channels over the summer. So that means that somebody updated that rating curve with new measurements sufficiently that they got essentially the discharge dead on with their measurements. That's pretty impressive. If you've ever tried to make uh, discharge measurements yourself and to create a rating curve, you realize it takes about two or three years to get a good quality rating curve. And then that to keep updating it is to keep good quality data available for the nation. So these data were fundamental for developing almost all aspects of hydrologic science. So if you go to the winners of the Horton Award in hydrology or any of the hydrology awards given out at AGU, you'll find that there are people that develop flood frequency, analysis, statistical methods in hydrology. We give a Langbein lecture in honor of uh, a Langbein who actually uh, used these data to develop uh, various kinds of flood frequency and other analyses. These were recently updated by Tim Cohn and others with, with a publication this past uh, summer of the, the methods of uh, uh, flood frequency analysis uh, that's uh, ad advised by the USGS. Close to my heart, my uh, graduate advisor, Luna Leopold, back in 1953, uh, took all of the data that he could find on the rivers in the Midwest and use it, used it to develop the downstream hydraulic and attestation hydraulic geometry of rivers. This ended up being one of the fundamental step forwards to change geomorphology from a qualitative science where people went out and looked at hill slopes and tried to decide whether this peanut plane matched this peanut plane, instead turned it into a science where people measured things and then tried to understand the relationship between such things as the, uh, the hydraulic geometry or the characteristic of the rivers and the flooding that actually created them. We are more recently continuing uh, these projects by looking at uh, larger databases and um, uh, looking at scaling relationships, for example. So this is along the entire uh, east coast of the United States where Carolyn uh, Plank has been looking at scaling relationships between discharge um, and basin area for different magnitudes of flood events. And she's been using that to uh, show that as you go uh, downstream into larger river basins that the uh, scaling relationship decreases, the exponent of that decreases, which corresponds with essentially an increase in flood attenuation. And this is different among different river systems. So we can go into these databases that even though they've been used um, for a long time to evaluate different types of processes, there's all kinds of new things that we can do. And these data represent some of the big data um, approaches that we take to science, which in hydrology we've been taking for essentially the past 50 years. I'm going to pass the torch on to uh, Sujay, who's going to talk about uh, applying the USGS data and its new sensor um, information to understand water quality and trends with that with time. Thanks, Karin. Um, as Karin mentioned, we're in the same department and we've had some conversations on the USGS data and, and uh, this is more of an exercise in gratitude. And so um, the two things that I'll try to talk about are the USGS data as a national treasure and so when you, we're in D.C. right now and you think of national treasure, you think of maybe the monuments or documents. But these data sets and the chemistry behind the data sets and the quality of the measurements, how long, how long the measurements um, have lasted, uh, they really are a record into our history and how we've managed the landscape, managed the air, and, um, and they can really tell us a lot. And so in terms of protecting and preserving this national treasure, we have to ask ourselves the question, 
what's the value of history in the future in terms of maintaining these networks and, and nurturing and supporting them? And the other is that um, by looking at long-term trends and what happens in the water over time, it also helps us plan in terms of national water, water security. You can't make any changes or adjustments in how you do things if you don't know how things are in the past um, or how they're happening in real time. So I'm just going to um, start off with you know, just my personal limited experiences with the USGS data sets. And, and um, I, I have never worked for the USGS myself uh, or uh, I've never done a postdoc there, but um, just looking at some of their data. So um, we relied on USGS data and the gauging stations uh, when I first moved to Maryland, but I, I also looked and found that in, in the late last decade uh, looked at temperature trends in rivers. And so there are temperature trends that exist to look at the effects of climate change and, and warming on rivers. Some of the longest ones are in drinking water supplies like you see on the left, but they're very coarse. So you get maybe um, you know measurements that happened every month or every couple days. And um, so we started looking for better records across the United States. And we came across the USGS data and I fell in love with it the first time I saw it. Because in the 1970s, the USGS started uh, putting out sensors for temperature. And so we started looking at this data where they had daily data on temperature. And um, then there were these other probes that they had put out, specific conductance. And it was amazing. It just really was amazing. I, was, I remember looking at it uh, one evening, and I kept on looking at it all night. And um, downloaded all these sites and looked at all these different sites across the country. And um, we wrote a paper uh, on uh, temperature trends. It was very, it was kind of a coarse paper um, with this USGS data. And then Karen Rice, who was here a couple days ago, she wrote a very excellent, rigorous paper in the Chesapeake Bay watershed on temperatures. And, and she was able to show that air temperature and water temperatures were related, something that we couldn't really do. But um, that was the introduction. And then after that, we started looking at other data at these sites and uh, just going through the gauges one by one, seeing what, what types of data that, that they had. And uh, each, each site had its own story. And I, I know Bob Hirsch is in here. And he looks, at, he looks at these USGS gauges and tries to wring out every, like a sponge, every little bit of information you can get from a data point. And um, it's, just, it's just really neat. You know, it's like a puzzle. But, one thing um, we started looking at and, and finding was that there were these increasing alkalinity trends, and they were happening um, over the last maybe five decades and prior to the Clean Air Act. And so um, we were looking at what, you know, what potentially caused it. And so uh, we, we thought it was human accelerated weathering. That was one cause. There's many causes, but that's one of them. And we looked at USGS data sets, and if you look at these data sets, you can see they span um, decades, and uh, you know there's no gaps in these, or not many, and these aren't even the best records. And then we used a USGS data product that actually, the USGS has created maps of the lithology and the karst topography, and that was really um, a key in, in helping us with our analysis. And then uh, other USGS scientists like uh, Ted Stetz, who's here at the conference, has really done some nice work on this, and other academic scientists have used this USGS data. So um, eventually we started looking at um, these different sites across the United States, and these are some of the, um, some of the, these are sites where we looked at increasing pH and specific conductance trends over 50 years. So there have been other um, USGS scientists uh, someone named Awning, who I've never met. I really followed his work, and uh, he's, he did some really nice work on total dissolved solids. And then Lori Sprague has, done a, uh, has written a really nice paper recently. But what's interesting is that there was increased pH in these rivers and specific conductance um, that happened simultaneously, and they were related to one another. And the pH trends were happening before uh, the Clean Air Act and the acid rain amendments. And so there were questions about what caused this. And so we looked at this, U this USGS data and looked at the relationships between specific conductance and found that salts, alkaline salts, were increasing uh, uh, the pH and the buffering capacity. And you can see up and down the East Coast, um, there were, uh, the, the arrows are thalassen slopes for uh, the increasing trends. So you can do trend analysis with the, um, with the USGS data, but you can also look at concepts. And so I'm a teacher. I mean, part of my job is, is research, but 
the part that I probably like the most uh, is probably teaching, actually. And I teach two groups of students. Um, one group is introductory geology for non-majors, and the other group is uh, upper-level graduate students in environmental geochemistry. And so when we teach about weathering or the rock cycle, we talk about processes. We show it out of the textbook and talk about processes that can happen over millions of years and, and the rock cycle. And so um, by, using, by looking at the USGS data, just sketching out, we, we were able to uh, you know, draw a concept that, because um, my students would always ask me questions about, uh, about different things with weathering and salts. And so um, basically this was a, an application of USGS data to propose a conceptual model uh, that uh, was based on, on the USGS data. Now, I think one of the most exciting things that's happening is uh, that the sensor data. As I mentioned before, in the 1970s, the USGS started doing some of this, I mean, some really pioneering work, and now they've expanded it to all kinds of sensors. And so this is work with Doug Burns, um, a USGS scientist, and also it benefited from uh, peer reviews from Matt Miller. In fact, Matt Miller at the USGS reviewed two of our papers this year. He wasn't a, a journal reviewer, he just reviewed them. And, uh, you know, I've known Matt since I was in graduate school, he just did it out of the goodness of his heart. And so these types of input and collaborations directly with the USGS scientists, plus the data sets are, are just a big resource. So in this, in this particular work, we were trying to um, look at ways to break up the sensor data to show that there are different groups of, of chemicals that are transported um, in watersheds as, as groups where you could basically um, devise a surrogate or proxy for different classes of, of chemicals. And so, we um, propose that the watershed acts like a sieve, a filter, a reactor, and chromatograph for these, for these different element, elemental groups. And then the USGS actually has sensor data, uh, very detailed sensor data at sites like this in the Passaic River, where you can look at different um, constituents and how they behave. Like there's, when there's a peak in discharge during a hurricane, you can see that there's sieving and flushing of sediments where they're rapidly transported and they settle out, and then other, um, dissolved organic matter has a longer peak because it's, it's um, lighter and smaller. And then there's chromatographic elements all the way to the right, which are eluded and diluted uh, from exchange sites on the soil. So in conclusion, I th this USGS data shapes scientific cultures and collegiality and educational values about em empirical and analytical approaches. And then this is just the USGS data, but there's also all kinds of USGS data products like Bob has developed um, uh, tools for visualizing data and analyzing data, and he once said, Sujay, he's like, I like your work, but you need to up your game in terms of the analyses. Well, I did, Bob, because our students this summer have been learning EGRIT and uh, working together to learn all that stuff, and it's, it's, it's really cool. So nurturing and expanding these networks may be the key to protecting national water security to see what's happened in the past. And then access to these data tools and people, like Karin mentioned, the people are a resource that we may consider supporting. I know it sounds probably cheesy to say national treasure, but it's something that we take for granted. Thank you. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions, but thank you. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Lexi Schultz from the American Geophysical Union. She's going to go a cappella without a, uh, a presentation. It doesn't hurt to have a one talk without slides all day, right? So, um, so I'm, I'm Lexi Schultz. I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs for the American Geophysical Union, and that is roughly uh, AGU's policy office. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about DC as a center for collaboration on science policy in particular. So there are a large number of science societies who have a presence in DC, and we have a lot of overlap, overlapping interests, overlapping members. Um, and so what we have collectively done in different, in different guises, and I'll talk about them, is form different coalitions. So coalitions are where um, individuals, representatives of the science societies come together over shared interests. And there are a number of reasons we do this. One is that we literally believe that the whole is going to be greater than the sum of its parts. 
And the second reason is because we want to avoid overlap. We don't want to confuse policymakers with similar but slightly different messages, nor do we want to duplicate our efforts. Um, our time is all very precious. Um, so I'm going to go over some of the coalitions, but there's kind of an overview of the sorts of things that we do. So um, I talked about the fact that we have shared interests. We do a number of shared activities. Collectively, when science societies come together, what we're talking about doing is promoting the particular interest. So for example, we have a geosciences working group that I'll talk about in a minute. We're promoting our shared interests and educating policymakers about those shared interests. So it's very much about that building awareness and building education. The types of things that we do together, um, we, have, um, we share intelligence. What's happening from a policy perspective? What's happening in the latest state of science? Sometimes what's happening on the part of our members? Um, are they having, for example, trouble coming to the United States, which cuts across the sciences? Um, we will bring in speakers to talk to us to help um, educate all of us together. We do a lot of activities on Capitol Hill. So we will have joint congressional visits days, we hold briefings, we hold receptions. I'll talk some more about the specifics of that. Um, we write letters together. If we send up uh, a message to an agency, to the White House, to members of Congress on, for example, science funding, it's much more powerful it's if it's coming from 5, 10, 25, 50 organizations than it is if each individual organization signs a letter. And then um, lastly, we do um, collectively focus on particular areas of legislation, and we've had some real victories by working together in this fashion. So the one that's probably closest to this community um, is the Geosciences Working Group. Um, this is a broad array of the geosciences, cutting across everything from a, a broad group like AGU to groups that work on soils, to groups that work on water, and groups that work on oil and gas. Because it's so broad, we really focus on the top line of the value of the earth and space sciences. Um, we, we meet monthly. We um, visit the Hill together, and we have now done 19 congressional visits days. Every September, we bring in members from our societies to meet with the Hill, and this last year was a record number. It was 50 um, members of our societies, 50 scientists, who collectively had 74 congressional meetings, and this is all in a day. And collectively, we work to educate the members we bring in on things like what's happening on the Hill, how do you have successful policy visits. Um, so we're able to hit a much broader array of scientists than if we were doing it individually. Um, I mentioned some of the other Hill activity we do. We hold briefings together and we'll focus on particular areas. For example, um, we'll look at how the geosciences are very important for the economy and that by doing it collectively, we get to hit on a much broader array of issues. Um, we've held receptions. Um, and we focus on legislation. So one of our biggest victories was that there was legislation um, in an earlier Congress that would have told the National Science Foundation how to direct its funding according to directorate. And the way it was structured, it would have put the geosciences at a disadvantage. So by working together, by all sending the same message, by um, dividing up the work, we were able to work with Congress to overturn that measure and restore the decision-making uh, power to NSF as to how to allocate the funding according to the merit review process. Um, so these are all things that the Geosciences Working Group has done together. Um, one of the other really big ones that we're involved in is the Climate Sciences Working Group. So very similar in that these are societies that individually care about the climate sciences, either have climate scientists or have positions on climate change. Um, and it's everything from AGU, AMS, the American Meteorological Society, the Geologic Society of America, to the American Statistical Association, American Physical Society, Chemical Society, and um, Agricultural Sciences and some labs. Um, and it's a little broader than that. And again, every year we do a Climate Sciences Day. This one is in February. Um, so if there are any climate scientists in the audience who are interested, please see me after. Um, and we recruit climate scientists to come in and meet with their members of Congress. We have a very strong focus on education there. What we're looking to do is to, again, across all of our areas of expertise, 
educate members of Congress on, on real climate science, and it's sometimes people who might not have ever talked to a climate scientist before, um, but because we're bringing in people from their states and their districts, from their universities, we have kind of much broader reach that way. Um, and this past year, this was our eighth climate science day, so last um, February, um, 19 participants in 69 congressional meetings. So obviously 69 congressional meetings is way more than any individual society could do in one day otherwise. So it's just an example. Um, another broad area is there are a lot of coalitions that have formed to support particular agencies. There's a coalition for NSF, a coalition for USGS, Friends of NOAA, um, the Coalition for Aerospace Science, which focuses on NASA. There's an Energy Sciences Coalition that focuses on the Department of Energy. Some of the interesting things that these coalitions do is host receptions, which are very, very specific, specifically focused on bringing in examples of great science being done by the agencies, or in the case of NSF, being funded by the agency. Um, and we get these big rooms on Capitol Hill. We have fabulous tables and posters. And congressional staff and members of Congress come through. And they really get exposure to understanding not just the science, but the role that the agencies play in fostering that science and carrying out great research. Um, so these, these types of coalitions are very, very important to each of the agencies. And um, one thing that we do is we build very close relationships with the agency officials and staff, in particular the congressional liaison, but higher officials as well. And then these agencies know who to go to if they need some help kind of promoting awareness of their own work. Um, on top of that, we have some kind of more unusual coalitions. So there's a group called the Non-Defense Discretionary Coalition. OK, so what the heck is that? Um, every year on Capitol Hill, funding is a big, big debate. All science funding comes under a category that's called non-defense discretionary. Non-defense because there's an entire pot that's just defense. And then the discretionary just means it doesn't fall under things like Social Security or Medicare that the government has no choice but to spend. So when you look across the board, the entire non-defense discretionary pot is fairly small. And every year, there's a fight to make sure that that pot is, um, gets at least kind of parity with the defense side of things. We know that the defense community has spoken with one voice. It gives them a lot of clout and power. So there are a number of different types of sectors, not just the science sector, but healthcare, security, education, um, that have come together to say we want to collectively speak with one voice and um, basically have the, the rising water lift all boats, essentially, that we're all in it together and we're going to maintain our collective funding by supporting this overall pot of money. Um, there's a group called the Task Force on American Innovation. This is an entirely separate coalition that focuses just on the kind of research and development and technology funding, um, but also looking kind of across the board at the kind of increases in funding for the sciences and technology over time. Now, this group is interesting because it has a lot of business leaders as part of it as well. A few of the other coalitions do, but this one in particular. And the business leaders, um, led an effort to promote a 4% increase in science funding every year. That effort ultimately turned into a letter signed by 500 organizations. And that was um, then championed by a couple of senators. And we have more and more support for this in Congress because of the, the breadth of that support within the, the nonprofit and scientific society and business community. And then, um, I mean, I could talk more. There, there are more. There are more and more individualized ones. But another broad category are coalitions have sprung up specifically to focus on issues of scientific integrity. Now, this is very broad. Um, it encompasses everything about concerns for how science advice is um, being used within federal agencies to efforts by members of Congress to interfere in the merit review process or interfere in science in some fashion. And so collectively, groups have come together to try to elevate this as an issue and a concern and to talk about the, the damage to decision making and to the fabric of our society if we don't uphold the independence um, and integrity of science. 
Um, so I think that's, that gives you kind of a sense of what we're talking about. Um, there are so many different societies. We all, I mean, this, this is a very, very productive relationship we have with these other societies. Um, certainly, um, I have a team of five people, and we connect with our sister societies on, a, on an almost constant basis. And a lot of the other societies who are represented here, um, either at speaking or attending, are part of these coalitions. So if you have any questions or if you ever doubt that we're working together, you know, please ask because we do work very closely together. So, Thank it. you. So we have some time for questions. Um, I'm going to take chair's privileges. So uh, you mentioned several uh, numbers in terms of congressional visits. Do you have a ballpark for the number of congressional visits that uh, folks at this meeting are taking part in this week? Uh -huh. So um, we actually, tomorrow, we have a Congressional Visits Day. Um, we have 200 um, AGU fall meeting attendees who have volunteered to set up congressional meetings on their own. Um, we have asked them if they can set up anywhere from two to five meetings. So we will expect, we will see tomorrow what it turns out to be, but I expect it to be in the hundreds, if not more, congressional meetings. Um, and um, some of them are going in teams, so we'll see how it shakes out. But um, they might hit a pretty broad swath of Congress. So. Awesome. Okay, we do have some questions. Um, so we have, because it's a virtual audience, we have a mic over there. Um, if you don't want to get over to it, we'll just ask the speaker to repeat it. But thank you for going over to it. Um. <laughs> yeah, Martha had to do it twice, so. <laughs> well, a, a very nice uh, overview of the sort of collaborations. One that I remember that might have been before your time at AGU was a collaboration in support of education in particular that was started with AIP, the Air American Institutes of Physics. Is that a productive coalition anymore or are there particular ones that support science education? So there are, there are groups that are um, specifically focused on science education. There are still some coalitions that do so. Um, we've tended to work with them more kind of individually. So some of the um, organizations like um, NCSE, for example, I always get this wrong, but National Coalition on Science Education, I think. Um, I might have that wrong, I apologize. But so we've tended to work with them kind of individually rather than in coalition, but there are groups that are, that are focused primarily on science education that still do meet. So, is there another question? Hey, um, will, will any of the coalitions be supporting or advocating for the Green New Deal? <laughs> Um, so that's a great question. So um, a lot of the focus of the Green New Deal, from what I understand, is about kind of regulation um, and kind of very specific solutions on the climate change issue. Because these coalitions are primarily made up of science societies, most of whom do, do not take positions on regulation, on policy. It's so we, what our, um, our collective advocacy goal is about promoting science itself through science funding and science integrity and having that science inform the decision making. So for example, we might say we would be very interested in ensuring that the Green New Deal takes into account climate science. Um, but we, you know, where it uh, involves more specific policies and regulations, that tends not to be our coalitions. Thank you, Lexi. So I want to thank uh, all of our speakers and uh, the audience and our virtual audience for being here. Thank you. <laughs>